Let's stay focused. I looked in the mirror of our beautiful double sink and suite. What I saw I was quite satisfied with. Married for 20 years to a stunning woman whom I absolutely adored, one incredible daughter of whom I was extremely proud, a job that ensured financial security until retirement and beyond, and a body mine, which was in great shape for a 43-year-old. I was living a comfortable life that many men dreamed of. Yep. I was one of the fortunate ones. Well, if you don't count the long hours spent at work to secure our income. And let's not forget the challenging, but ultimately rewarding, time spent pursuing the woman of my dreams. And the difficult nights of taking care of our sick daughter as she grew from a fragile one-year-old to a bright teenager, and now a college student studying to be a doctor. Yep, luck played a part, but the main reason for our success was hard work and dedication. Rachel, my wife, stopped working when our daughter Megan was born. It was unfortunate, as Megan was a sickly child who needed constant attention from both Rachel and me. Rachel was a qualified architect, but never had the opportunity to pursue her dream career because of her commitment to raising our daughter. It made me sad for her. We met during our second year of college, she studying in the design and architecture faculty, and me in engineering. She always spoke passionately about designing the perfect buildings, so I couldn't help but feel for her. However, she never expressed any sadness about not being able to work. She was a determined person who simply did what needed to be done. My name is Tom. Tom Wildthorpe, and I earn my living by troubleshooting engineering problems in power plants all over the country. This often involves unexpected travel, which has been a big part of our married life. I could have chosen to stay in office positions, but Rachel and I decided that the extra income would make our financial life much easier. Luckily, Rachel adjusted to this expectation early on and never complained about my absences, although I always felt guilty for leaving at a moment's notice. I was rarely gone for more than two nights, so I made sure she knew how much I loved her and how grateful I was for her support while I was away. I had a golden rule that if I was away for one night, I would plan a one-night activity to make it up to her. The same went for two nights or three nights. Two nights away meant two special activities and so on. Luckily, our parents lived within a 20-minute drive from our house, so babysitting was never a problem. I returned my attention to the image in the mirror. I was a very content man. I shaved as I always do when I get home. I have a travel shaving kit in my bag, but it never quite gives me the same close and smooth shave as I get at home. Rachel loves it when I shave. She knows I do it just for her. It annoys her when I have stubble on my chin. A smoother shave guarantees at least three happy moments for her before we get intimate. No itchy chin near her. I entered the kitchen to a warm hug. They both promised a busy evening. You owe me a night out, Rachel said lovingly, running her fingers over my smooth chin. Can I choose the place this time, of course, anything for you, I replied, returning her hug and smiling. Our eyes met, and I knew how much I loved this woman. I would do anything for her. We faced challenges in our lives, but we always came out on top. As expected, we enjoyed our date night and satisfied our desires later that evening. Since our daughter had moved out, we revealed in the freedom to express our love wherever we wanted in the house. We could be as loud as we pleased. It was a freedom we embraced, especially after the challenging early years of raising our child. Not that those years weren't rewarding. We wouldn't trade that time for anything, but it did put a damper on our love life. We both adored our daughter, Megan. She completed our marriage. There is nothing like the feeling of watching a small, helpless human being grow and develop, knowing they rely completely on the love and care of their parents. I sometimes felt jealous of the bond between a mother and daughter, but Megan always made it clear that I was her special dad. Rachel would give Megan a certain look during those moments, and I could sense their silent communication. Megan would then hug me and say, I love you, dad, which always melted my heart. The moment would pass, but the warm memory would be stored in my mind. Life went on, as it does. Not much later, I was called out on another two-day job in the North. I despised these assignments. The weather was usually freezing cold, and the flights always seemed to take forever. There were often long and boring waits in frigid airports, just adding to my frustration. When I arrived home, cold, frustrated, and exhausted, I did my usual routine. I hugged my wife and immediately went to the in-suite to take a shower. Trust me, 
a long, hot shower does wonders for adjusting my mood. Feeling somewhat normal again, I stared at the mirror, ready to begin my close shave routine. That's when I noticed it. What? What could possibly ruin my perfect life in this insuite? A small hair. A small black hair lodged between the tap on my side of the sinks and the white tiles. I am quite observant. It's part of my job to notice small details. Over the years, I have developed the habit of noticing things that others overlook, often leading to finding solutions to problems. I'm not obsessive about it, but it definitely helps in my line of work. I don't have black hair. It's a result of my Dutch heritage. All of my hair is a very light brown in color. Could it be Rachel's hair? Nope. She is of Danish descent, and her hair is a beautiful golden blonde. All of it, understand? Could it be Megan's hair? Did she come home while I was away? But why would she use our in-suite? She always used the main bathroom downstairs. Megan had pitch black hair when she was born, but it became more like Rachel's before she turned one. There was a goth stage she went through as an early teen. Uff, I remember those years vividly. It was a difficult time for me and Rachel. Megan often treated me with disdain and Rachel with rudeness. My friends reassured me that it was just a phase and that she would become human again soon. Luckily, that happened. She suddenly transformed into a kind and loving daughter who treated me with respect. Her relationship with Rachel, however, remained somewhat distant. During the goth phase, as we called it, Megan had black hair and embraced all the goth cliches. She has kept her hair black until now. It's possible that it's her hair in the sink area, but it's highly unlikely. Back to the issue at hand. My mind started racing, something it was used to doing. I did it every day as part of my job, delving into problems and finding solutions as quickly as possible. Perhaps my negative experience on the last job had pushed me into a pessimistic mindset. I looked at a seemingly insignificant detail and immediately jumped to the worst conclusion. It seemed like a massive leap to go from one stray hair to marriage trouble. But until I found another explanation, that's what it looked like. How did the hair get there? It had obviously been cut since it was of uniform thickness throughout. It didn't taper off to a thin end. Could it have been shaved? Or maybe cut with scissors? I checked my side of the bathroom cabinet and sure enough, all my shaving supplies were there. Razors, cream, scissors, everything. Now I had to figure out if anyone else had used them while I was away. This required some investigation. I organized my kit in a way that would easily show if it had been touched. Rachel would never use my kit because she prefers those lady shavers that are supposed to be smoother and, of course, more colorful. Part of me wanted to brush it all off and forget about it. But another part of me, growing more and more each day, wanted to get to the bottom of this strange situation before it completely disrupted our happy life. I kept telling myself that I must be mistaken. The following weeks felt like a surreal existence. I questioned everything I saw, heard, and felt. I became paranoid. I found myself constantly checking my shaving kit, searching for any signs. Every small disagreement was analyzed for hints. Even when we were intimate, I was on the lookout for anything unusual. If Rachel went out, I wondered where she went and if she might be doing something else. It was a really tough time for me. I thought I did a good job hiding it, as I was used to keeping a poker face at work. However, having to do it at home too pushed my stress levels through the roof. Something had to change. To make matters worse, I had to go on a short, one-night business trip the following week. When I returned, I checked my shaving kit as always. To my disbelief, it had been used. It wasn't in the exact spot where I left it. Someone had used it while I was away. I was furious and confused. What on earth was happening? I couldn't fully comprehend the implications of this discovery. I desperately hoped that the evidence was misleading. I shaved, took a shower, and went downstairs, feeling like I was in a daze. My hearing felt distant, as if I wasn't really paying attention to anything. Rachel noticed my bad mood and commented on it. Sweetheart, you've been working so hard. I've never seen you so stressed. Is there anything I can do to help? And there it was, that mischievous look, that always hinted at more than what was spoken. Usually, it meant an intimate moment together. Normally, I wouldn't refuse an invitation like that, with a loving touch and a glint in Rachel's eye. But this time, I just blurted out that I needed some time off. 
I explained that my job was taking a toll on me. Rachel said she understood and even suggested that I take a couple of days to relax by myself. She had a place in mind, a small bed and breakfast by the beach. We had always talked about going there for a weekend, but we never found the time. It will do wonders for you, she said. I love you so much and want you to recharge my paranoid mind immediately interpreted her suggestion in the worst possible way. I thought it was her way of doing something behind my back, just like when I was away on business trips. Reluctantly, I agreed to take some time off as soon as I could arrange it with work. Two weeks later, my work team was ahead on projects, so we were all given three days off as compensation. I packed my car with some clothes and books and began the drive. Before leaving, Rachel tried to be extra nice, but was more reserved when it came to intimacy. My paranoia only grew stronger. As I left our street, Rachel waved from our front garden. I had the urge to turn back and confess my suspicions, so she could explain everything and put my worries to rest once and for all. But my curiosity got the better of me. It was part of who I am, a stubborn streak inherited from my Dutch heritage. My father used to call me Cheesehead, a nickname for being stubborn. I had to know the truth. If I was wrong, life would continue and I would need to clear my mind of negative thoughts. I couldn't continue living with such depleted trust. However, if I was right, there would be consequences. Infidelity was something Rachel and I had agreed was not acceptable. We believed in complete faithfulness. I truly hoped Rachel believed in it too. My drive was short. I had arranged to leave my car at a mechanic's shop nearby telling them I needed a thorough service. I asked them not to contact me about any repairs or expenses, as I would handle it when I picked up the car. From there, I walked to the car rental agency and got a plain, white sedan. It was the most inconspicuous car available. These cars seemed to blend in with the rest, making them nearly invisible on the road. I drove back to our neighborhood, carefully choosing a spot to observe our house. Luckily, there was a secluded area with trees and bushes hidden from people's view. I made sure not to stay there too long at a time to avoid suspicion. I didn't want to seem like a nosy neighbor. During my surveillance, I saw Rachel's car leave. I immediately called her. I saw her glance at the phone before pulling over to answer. Hey, Rach, just wanted to check in with my favorite wife. How are things going? Missing me yet? Hi, babe. I was just thinking about you. What's this favorite wife talk? Do you have another, less favorite one? Hey, have you arrived? Of course you have. Are you settled in? Use this time to relax and let go of whatever is stressing you out. She was acting like a loving wife, genuinely concerned about my well-being. At that moment, I felt like a complete idiot. How could I have doubted her and let my thoughts spiral out of control? Thanks, Rachel. I really appreciate this time. What are you up to right now? Oh, nothing much really. I'm just reading while waiting for the laundry to finish. You know, the usual boring stuff. I'll probably be stuck at home all day catching up. Gotta go, Han. The laundry is almost done. I'll call you tonight. Bye, babe. Love you lots all right, Rach. Talk to you tonight. Why did she lie? She could have just told me honestly where she was going in the car. It wouldn't have bothered me. But now, something felt off. Discreetly, I followed her. She went to the local shopping center, but didn't get out of her car. It looked like she was waiting for someone. I noticed her on the phone as soon as she parked. Why would she do that? My mind started to spin with all the possibilities. It seemed increasingly likely that all was not as it seemed in our marriage. I didn't want to believe it. Even with mounting evidence, I desperately searched for a million reasons why it couldn't be true. But sadly, it was true. Not even two minutes after parking, a man got into Rachel's car. Their immediate passionate hug confirmed that this rendezvous was anything but innocent. It wasn't a fleeting moment of hesitation. It was familiar, comfortable, and filled with love. And that's when I couldn't hold it in anymore. I vomited. There were no warning signs, no physical symptoms. I immediately felt sick and overwhelmed. It was embarrassing, especially since other shoppers had seen me. They offered their help, and I had to accept. Wet towels and wipes miraculously appeared, and my car and I were cleaned up. The smell lingered, but at least I wasn't a mess anymore. I thought about heading straight to the hotel room I had booked, but I had to know for certain. I didn't know where they were going, but I had a pretty good idea based on what I saw. 
The drive back to our neighborhood felt like an eternity. With the windows open, I worried about being recognized as I parked in the secluded alcove, but no one seemed to be around. My eyes were dry, my mouth parched from the taste of vomit, but I stayed where I was. I needed to be absolutely sure. They were in the house for about four hours. Four hours of torture for me, but undoubtedly four hours of joy for them. Four hours passed, and then they hurriedly left the house. Rachel had parked in the garage as soon as she arrived home, and now, after four hours, she was leaving again. The man with Rachel had positioned himself in a way that made him invisible to casual observers, but I was not one of those. I could just barely see the top of his head, covered in pitch black hair, above the dashboard. Without thinking, I followed them back to the shopping center, where they shared another long hug before he got out of the car. Rachel drove away. The jerk casually walked over to another parked car and drove away as well. My shock turned into anger, a feeling I hadn't experienced since elementary school, when the schoolyard bully decided it was my turn to give him my lunch. He was much bigger than me and carried himself with an air of superiority, as if he could do whatever he pleased. Although I always watched from a distance as he bullied others, deep down, I wished I had the confidence to stand up to him. And now it was my chance. Do you mind giving me your lunch? Tommy Tucker, he sneered. Hey, I like that. Give me your food, Tommy Tucker, with a trembling voice, I said. No, find your own lunch. This one is mine. He was not accustomed to being denied, and he hesitated for a moment. Towering over me, he shouted, Give me your lunch right now. It was his shouting that made me angry. There was never any shouting in our house. I wasn't used to this level of hostility directed towards me. When I look back on that incident, I'm amazed by how brave I was. It wasn't fear I felt, just pure anger. This lunch was mine. My mom had bought special chocolate sprinkles from the store just for me. In Holland, it's a real treat to spread those on fresh bread with a generous amount of butter. I had been looking forward to enjoying my lunch. It was much better than the usual Vegemite sandwiches. So this time, when I responded, my voice was calm and detached. My classmates couldn't believe how calm and determined I appeared. They said they saw a threatening look in my eyes. If only John, the bully, had seen it too. I said no, get your own lunch. He attempted to grab my long hair, just as I had seen him do to his other victims many times before. It all seemed to happen in slow motion. As his arm came towards me, I stood up quickly and extended my left arm, the one not holding my lunch. I have big hands, thanks to my Dutch heritage. As I rose, my left hand tightened into a fist and connected with John's mouth and nose with all of the force of my upward motion. I'll never forget the sound it made. John's eyes widened in shock, and his mouth moved silently, like a fish out of water. Then he fell to the ground. He was writhing on the ground, screaming, as I crouched down beside him. With a calm, quiet voice, I whispered into his ear. I said no, but if you really need lunch so badly, here you go. I crumpled up my sandwiches, the delicious lunch I had eagerly anticipated, and stuffed them into his bleeding mouth. I don't think he could have bitten anything at that point, since I noticed a few loose teeth wobbling in the front of his mouth. I continued to rub and squash the sandwiches into his mouth until a teacher pulled me away. The cheers from the other kids were so loud that I almost couldn't hear what the teacher said. Tom, what on earth has gotten into you? Go to the office now. As the adrenaline wore off, I was led back to face the consequences. The office secretary caught me as I stumbled in, barely able to hold myself together. At such a young age, I didn't understand the true power of anger. My life had always been peaceful, surrounded by calm and happy people. And now, that anger returned after all these years. I followed that jerk back to his home, a well-appointed house not far from the shopping center. It was practically a mansion. The design was straight out of a home decor magazine. The perfect roof lines, the beautiful colors, and the large windows behind the wide porches screamed one word to anyone who saw it wealth the meticulously maintained gardens added to the impression. I took in his appearance now. He looked around the same age as Rachel and me, with dark black hair and a very fit physique. I would guess that he was of Mediterranean descent, given his thick black hair and tanned skin. His clothes were clearly expensive, almost like they were tailored specifically for him. 
The way he walked from his car to the front door exuded arrogance. I had encountered his type on construction sites before. They treated everything as if it existed solely to cater to their needs. They often treated those around them with disrespect. I had absolutely no patience for entitled people like him, but I reserved a special kind of contempt for this guy. A growing sense of dread washed over me, and I realized something else. When Rachel first picked him up, he had that scruffy one-day beard growth. I always jokingly referred to it as the terrorist look when I spotted it on workers I encountered. But when I saw him again, he was cleanly shaven. The wretch I exclaimed, the despicable jerk. It all makes sense now I was about to get out of the car and confront him pun intended, but a well-dressed woman emerged from the front door. They clearly knew each other as they exchanged brief hugs. He quickly retreated into the house while she went about her business in the front yard. Soon, a mini version of her, presumably her daughter, joined her. The daughter seemed strangely familiar, another detail to sort out later. They chatted and laughed together, finding amusement in some inside joke. It was time for me to leave. I had all the information I needed. Confronting this jerk would have to wait until later. As angry as I was, I didn't want to beat him up in front of his wife and young daughter. Not only was my wife cheating on me with this loser, but he was also cheating on his own wife and daughter. What a low life. How can someone do things to others that they know will cause pain and hurt, especially when there was no prior animosity? I could never understand that, but I had a feeling I would soon learn what it felt like. This jerk was going to face the consequences. I had tasks ahead of me. Being away from home turned out to be a blessing in disguise. It allowed me to take care of everything that needed to be done without having to make excuses. Unfortunately, the cheaters stuck to their usual pattern while I was away. Now, I no longer had to follow them everywhere. I knew what was happening. I took care of all the necessary preparations for the divorce. I changed beneficiaries on my credit cards and retirement account, redirected my income deposits, updated my utility company information, and canceled my phone plan. I did all the usual precautions. The abundance of online resources and self-help sites proved to be a great help, although it was sad to see how many resources were dedicated to marriages falling apart. I made an appointment with a divorce lawyer, though it struck me as odd how they referred to themselves as family lawyers when the majority of their work involved breaking up families. Go figure. The papers were ready, but I held off on serving them until I was ready. I hired a private investigator, spending a significant amount due to the urgency of my request, to fully document one day of Rachel's infidelity. I wanted to have proper evidence of the awful behavior displayed by these two. I also needed to talk to Megan, our daughter. Besides Rachel and me, she would be the one most affected by what I was about to do. Now, I wish I hadn't. If I thought this situation was already painful and devastating for my marriage to Rachel, for our family, and for my self-esteem and worth as a husband, I was sorely mistaken. Hi, Megan. We need to have a serious talk. It's about your mom and me. Were the first words out of my mouth as I entered her apartment. It's not going to be easy, so let's both sit down. Don't worry, it's not about you. It's about your mom and me. Dad, you look terrible. What happened? Oh no. You know, don't you? I'm sorry, but it's not just about you and mom. It involves me too. She burst into tears and hugged me tightly. She wouldn't let go as she tried to speak. Eventually, I had to hold her closer and calm her down until her sobs subsided. Megan, no, it's not your fault. It will affect you, all of us as a family. But it isn't because of anything you did. It's something that only concerns your mom and me. I have to tell you what's happening so you can be prepared for the chaos that will soon come our way. Nothing for you needs to change, except that our family will look a little different in the future. And her sobs only intensified. If anything, my words made her cry even harder, and she clung to me tightly. When she calmed down again, she pulled away slightly and looked at me with tear-filled, red eyes. Dad, what I'm about to tell you is something I've kept inside since I was a rebellious teenager. Remember when I went through that phase and acted out? I could see how worried you were, but I didn't care. I nodded and said, I remember Meg's. It was such a difficult time for all of us. Sorry, Dad. 
There was a reason why I became goth and displayed all those reckless behaviors. It wasn't just typical teenage rebellion. What I'm about to tell you is going to hurt you, I know. It hurt me immensely for years. I think you should sit down. I'll pour us each a strong drink I was rendered speechless. I had intended to tell my daughter about why I was divorcing her mother, but now she was promising me that what she was about to reveal would be devastating. I sat there, still and silent, waiting for her to continue. I unconsciously accepted the long glass of bourbon she handed me and took two large swallows of the burning liquid. Yes, Dad, we need to talk. We need to talk about me, and we need to talk about Mom. Let's start with Mom first. I assume you found out that Mom cheated on you many years ago. How old am I? Well, that many years ago, plus nine months. I was about to interrupt and clarify what I already knew, but Megan hushed me and continued. When I was about 13, you know, hormones, boys, self-esteem, mean friends. Well, one of my not-so-nice friends kept on at me about how my skin color didn't quite match yours or mom's. This bothered me a lot. I couldn't stop thinking about it. And on top of that, mom always insisted that I change my hair color when I interrupted. What do you mean, change your hair color this conversation was getting weirder and weirder? Mom always dyed my hair. She said she had been doing it since I was one. But I've seen the baby photos, Dad. My hair is naturally pitch black. I started feeling a sinking feeling in the pit of my stomach. My face grew paler, and I could feel my blood pressure dropping. No, that can't be true. Megan saved me from fainting by giving me two more sips of my drink. The strong, bitter liquid helped me calm down a bit. Drink up, Dad. There's more to this. I'm sorry. I've dreaded this moment since the day I found out myself. Drink up. There's plenty more in this bottle. Dad, Mom had an affair. It was with an old university friend of hers after you got married. All I can say, Dad, honestly, is that you weren't the biological father when I was conceived. There was a pause as Megan refilled my glass. But then she immediately hugged me tightly and cried on my shoulder. That comforting hug, which I always cherished during our happy times, now only resulted in wet shoulders and feelings of emptiness and hopelessness. I'm not sure who cried more, but in that moment, I couldn't imagine feeling any lower. Our mutual embrace was the only thing grounding me in the present. Dad. Dad. I think I understand what you're feeling, but I want you to know that I love you more than anything. You are my dad. You have always been my dad, and you always will be, no matter where my genes come from. Don't you remember that I always called you my special dad? That's because you are, and you always will be. Back then, I kept bothering mom about my concerns until one day, when you were away, she confessed about her affair with that guy I looked into her eyes when she used that derogatory name for her biological father. Yes, dad. That's what I'll always call him. To me, he's just that guy, the one who impregnated mom after cheating on you. That's how I've come to terms with my conception. You are my father, not him. I met him once. I think mom arranged it, pretending it was accidental. By then, I was going through my goth phase. I think my rebellious behavior was a result of my feelings of insecurity and disgust toward what mom did. For a while, I even resented you, thinking you must have been weak for allowing mom to stray. But eventually, I realized that you didn't know, and I replaced my anger toward you with love and sadness. I made it my mission to have a loving relationship with you, as it should be. I never really forgave mom. Anyway, I looked at that guy and he looked at me. I could tell he wasn't impressed. I mean, nothing scares a man more than seeing a pale-skinned, black-haired, skinny teenage girl wearing black clothes and accessories. I'm sure you get the picture. Mom tried to make me dress differently, but you know how I was back then. His sneer while saying to Mom, what a disappointment remained on his face. I remember looking back at him with just as much attitude and replying, not only to him but to Mom as well, you're nothing but a liar. You preyed on married women who wanted to secretly act like different people. You couldn't find your own girlfriend, probably because you're such a jerk he stormed off, and mom quickly rushed me back into the car. She scolded me the whole way home, warning me about what would happen if I ever told you or even hinted about what I knew. She threatened to tear our family apart and make our lives miserable. I'm sorry, Dad, but I was just a teenager, and I couldn't handle that level of responsibility. 
I decided to do as mom wished and not say a word Megan got a spark in her eyes and continued, but I always called you my special dad after that. I could see how much it meant to you. Mom didn't like it, and she always gave me strange looks whenever I said it. I found a way to rebel against her while keeping my promise and giving you some of the love and respect you deserved. Drink up, Dad. You made it through the shocking revelation. Now we need to talk about what comes next, Megan. I came here to tell you that I'll be divorcing Mom. Everything is already in motion. I just didn't want it to come as a surprise to you. After hearing what you've shared, so many things make sense now. I had no idea you weren't my biological daughter. But please understand, Megs, you will always be my daughter, and learning about all this only makes me prouder of you. My heart is filled with love and pride, which balances out the pain, hurt, betrayal, anger, emptiness, and despair. We embrace tightly once again, feeling the love and connection that defined our relationship as father and daughter. But Megan, dear Megs, now it's your turn to have a drink I passed her glass to her. Drink up, Megs. There's more. Recently, I found out that mom didn't end the affair after you were born. She has continued it, and she's continuing it now. As we speak, she is with that guy as you called him, in our own home. No, dad, no. How could she do this to you, to us? I know she's my mom, but right now she's just a cheating liar. Megan. That's enough. Even though I agree with everything you just said, she's still your mother and she always will be. It's okay for me to call her a liar, because soon she won't be my wife we looked at each other, and unexpectedly, I started laughing. Soon, Megan joined in, and we laughed until the tears of joy washed away the tears of sorrow. I think after our next glass of drink, we became serious again. What's his name, Megs? The guy who's your biological father, I mean. Do you know? Yes, Dad, I do. His name is Miguel Rodriguez. His family has always been wealthy. Apparently, his father started a high-end car import company and Miguel manages it. He and mom were together in college. I think mom was attracted to his money at the time, but he ended things when his family didn't approve. They never really got over each other. Besides that, there isn't much else to add I know where he lives, Megs. The jerk has a wife and daughter. It's no wonder his daughter looked familiar. She's the spitting image of you at that age, only younger. And by the way, she has black hair, not the brown I remember you having dad. This day can't get any stranger. What are you going to do? No, what are we going to do? You're not alone in this, dad. I know mom cheated, or rather, is cheating on you, but she's also betrayed me. We can't let this go. Megs, let me handle it. As I said earlier, everything is being taken care of regarding your mom. I need to rethink what I'll do about that jerk, I mean, Miguel, when I arrived home at the expected end of my time away to recharge, Rachel greeted me with open arms. She went for the usual tight hug, but I pulled away abruptly. She seemed shocked and asked, Babe, what's wrong? Did something happen I didn't want to reveal what I knew just yet? So I suppressed my anger and put on my best poker face. Just something at work, Ratch. I thought this time away would be good for me, but I just found out that more problems came up while I was gone. After saying it, I realized my mistake and quickly added, I mean while I was away this time. There will be a lot of things to sort out, and it might mean more time away. I'm sorry. Rachel looked at me with a puzzled expression. She clearly didn't know how to interpret my words. Eventually, she must have settled on an innocent explanation, probably because she and Miguel had gotten away with their affairs for so long without suspicion. Why would today be any different, right? The next few days were crazy. I tried my best to act as normally as possible, but when you feel physically sick at any hint of close contact, it is hard to hide that something is off. Rachel seemed to accept my excuse of work problems as the reason for my weirdness. I had to get away again. Being close to Rachel was driving me crazy with anger. Two days later, I made the call to go away again, pretending that this was a longer than usual stay away. Rachel accepted it as one of my usual absences and didn't wait long to invite her friend Miguel over as usual. This time it would be different, however. As soon as he arrived at our house, in Rachel's car, I called 911 on a phone I had purchased at the local store. Hi. This is John Rodriguez. I think my brother Miguel has been kidnapped and is being held at 25 miles parade, my address. Please hurry. 
There is a woman in the house with him, and I think she is armed. Hurry, please hurry. I hung up before the operator could start to ask identifying questions. The wait near my usual tree alcove was going to be great. It was less than five minutes later that I heard the sirens. I couldn't have asked for a better response. A police car, an ambulance, a first response SWAT unit, and, to top it all off, a roaming news crew with live broadcast capability came to a screaming, noisy halt in front of our house. These guys, I found out later, were doing just such an exercise in a quieter part of the neighborhood when the call came in. Talk about coincidence. Heavily armed paramilitary-looking soldiers fanned out around the house, climbing the back fence as well. The camera crew caught the action live and in full color. This is going better than expected, I thought. The sirens calmed down to be replaced by a loud hailer announcing that the police were here. The speaker requested that all occupants of the house had 20 seconds to come out of the house. Miguel Rodriguez's name was also repeated many times, and it was requested that if he was in the house, he needed to make himself known and exit through the front door. There was no exit from the front door, so the decision was made quickly for the SWAT team to enter. Stun grenades were heard, followed by smoke grenades. These guys knew their stuff. Within 20 seconds, two individuals were dragged out through the front door and placed, rather roughly face down on the front lawn. Handcuffs on, they were stood up. Rachel was offered a coat by one of the policewomen. Rachel gladly accepted and was seen to try to cover herself while her hands were cuffed. The coat did hide her, but it was clear that she was without clothes. Nobody worried about Miguel. I wonder if anyone else would notice that he was rather lacking in certain aspects. To be fair, Maybe it was the situation which made him shy. I had to chuckle. It took the police a while to ascertain the facts of the situation and reluctantly release the two individuals, but the damage was done. After all of the emergency personnel had left, the neighborhood was buzzing with gossip. I had to make myself scarce in case I was identified. The fun was had. Now it was time to wait until things got messy. Mrs. Amanda Rodriguez received an anonymous phone call to inform her that there was an interesting news broadcast that night. The news broadcast was indeed interesting. Obviously, no revealing parts were shown, but it was extremely clear that the couple was not dressed. The couple was identified as a Mrs. Rachel Wildthorpe and a Mr. Miguel Rodriguez. They were not husband and wife, but were found undressed in the residence of the Wildthorpes. No comment was offered by the couple, except to say that the couple would be taking legal action against the authorities. Hi, Rachel, I asked as I called her that night. It took all of my self-control to stop from laughing as I spoke. How was your day? Oh, um, hi, Tom. It was okay. Have you seen the news yet tonight? No, not yet. I have some reports to finish. I'll probably get to see the late news before I go to bed. I wanted to prolong her anxiety by adding, it isn't the same as our local news, though. Why? Did something happen that I should know about this should be interesting? Um, no, not really, but we will need to talk when you get back that sounds serious. Okay, I'll see you in a couple of days. Bye and I hung up. This should make Rachel worried. I have never hung up on her before. I don't know what happened in the Rodrigues household that night, but it seemed that Miguel was not living there at present. Apparently he stayed at work. His father's car dealership had a fully self-contained flat attached which he now treated as his home. I knew as soon as Miguel and Rachel met up again. This time they decided that our house was not a good option, and besides, the neighbors were all now very curious about what was going on in the Wildthorpe household. The hotel which they chose was managed by Tom Worrells. Tom was an honest, hard-working individual who disliked what his hotel was often used for. He could immediately sense when a couple was up to no good. The couple who rented a room that night did not seem right. This feeling was confirmed when a well-dressed gentleman entered his office shortly after the suspicious couple went to their room. He politely asked which room the recent customers had rented. He also placed a rather large amount of money on the front counter and requested a spare key to that room. Tom was bothered by this. He was an honest man. Bribes usually ended badly. The well-dressed man, who introduced himself as Roger, explained the reason for his request. Now, this was a different matter. Tom agreed. The money also went into the cash register. The two cheaters, who were both undressed and engaged in an inappropriate position, 
were beyond surprised when their room suddenly seemed rather crowded. There was a man in a suit holding two envelopes and another man, the hotel manager, holding a video camera. This camera was a nice touch. I had offered the process server extra money if he could capture the action on video. The suited man asked Rachel, are you Mrs? Rachel Wildthorpe, all Rachel could do was nod, yes, while trying to cover herself. You have been served, this was said very coldly and clinically as she was handed one of the envelopes. Before Rachel could even cry, he turned to Miguel. Are you Mr. Miguel Rodriguez? Yes, I am. What of it? You, sir, have also been served with that. Miguel was also handed an envelope. The two additional men left the room to the sound of shouting and arguing interspersed with crying and loud wailing. As you can imagine, shortly after that, my phone started ringing nonstop. It was one call, after another, interspersed with the notification sounds of incoming text messages. I ignored all of them, not in any mood to engage in any sort of communication with my unfaithful soon-to-be ex-wife. I did call Megan and inform her of what had happened. She wished me luck and again reiterated that she loved me and would always be there for me. She also said she would turn her phone off and that if I needed to speak to her, I could call her best friend Amanda. After I recorded the new number, I hung up. Rachel would now be unable to communicate with Megan and myself. I called a local realtor and explained that I needed a short term, about six month lease in an area close to my work. The agent, AMS, Jones, pointed me to a few possibilities along with their website brochures. I called her back after 30 minutes, informing her of the one I had chosen. It was a nice, fully furnished one-bedroom apartment on the second floor of a gated community only 10 minutes walk from my office. Perfect. I especially loved the fact that it was gated. There would be no unexpected visitors at strange times. All I needed now was to move all my belongings. I really didn't want to meet with Rachel at this point, so I devised a plan for her to be out of the house. All I needed was two hours. I had a trailer hooked up to my car and three co-workers ready to go. My spare phone was going to be very useful. Rachel was a mess. First, the unexpected visit by the SWAT team and that embarrassing sort of arrest. She was sure that the whole neighborhood had seen her in all her undressed glory. Her years of unfaithfulness were now fully exposed to the world. Strangely, she hoped beyond hope that Tom would not see this. The arrest incident was not enough to keep her and Miguel separated for long. They clung to their need to be together even after that embarrassing incident. Their need led them to meet up at a hotel again. Then, being served at the hotel, life couldn't get any messier. For the umpteenth time in the last few days, she shook her head and reflected on how she ended up in this situation. There was no doubt in her mind that her predicament was entirely her own doing. Apart from the frequent absences, her husband was the best. He doted on her, he worked hard to provide a comfortable life, he loved her. She knew that deep down. So why did she have an affair with Miguel? It's not like he was any better in bed than Tom. He didn't have the time to spend romancing her, as he did when they first met. That was mainly due to his wife and daughter. That wife who was so accepted by the high-ranking Rodriguez family. The old man Rodriguez despised Rachel from the start. And his wife Maria always looked at her as if she was some kind of disgrace, just for being with their precious son. Rachel's family didn't live in the well-to-do side of town, but they were good, hard-working, respectable people. Obviously not good enough for the Rodriguez clan. Their constant comments and criticism slowly wore Miguel down to the point that he was hesitant to even speak with Rachel. He loved the physical side of their relationship and enjoyed being with her, but every time they met, Rachel could see the disapproving looks and the guilt on Miguel's face. He eventually ended their relationship. It broke Rachel's heart. She had given her heart and herself to Miguel, but even though she knew he loved her, his family had a stronger hold on his heart than she did. She despised that family with a passion. She heard that Miguel had gone from girlfriend to girlfriend to girlfriend over the next two years, never settling on any one person. Maybe none of them are good enough for the Rodriguez family, either she thought bitterly. Exactly how the next stage of their relationship started was still a blur to Rachel. She encountered him on campus. She was already committed to Tom and knew that he was the one she wanted to marry, but Miguel had this strange attraction for her. It wasn't the physical aspect. What was it? 
Maybe in some way it was revenge on the Rodrigues family for the cruel way she was treated by them. She thought about that idea often, but realized the relationship between herself and Miguel wasn't as shallow as that. It was more. She just couldn't let go of her first love, even though Tom was there also. She and Miguel met discreetly frequently while at university. Rachel at first felt guilty about deceiving Tom. She knew it was wrong as her and Tom had discussed exclusivity many times. It was all so easy. Tom was stressed finding time to study. He found time to be with her whenever he could, but she still had plenty of time to spend with Miguel. The deception became easier and easier until it became a habit. One that was hard to break, even after she and Tom were married. She was always discreet with Miguel, making sure that any meetings were at times when Tom was busy at work or off on one of his many field trips. It was all going well for Rachel until that fateful day that she knew she was pregnant. She never used protection with Miguel, foolishly relying on the rhythm method to avoid pregnancy. For nine months, Rachel could not be sure who the father of the baby was going to be. She prayed to any god who would listen that the baby was Tom's, but part of her secretly was intrigued by the idea that it might be Miguel's child. The constant worry and questions about the paternity of her child played on Rachel. She later wondered if this unsettling pregnancy in some way caused the fragile health of Megan. As soon as she held little Megan in her arms, she knew. It was Miguel's. She knew without a doubt. The hair color, the eyes, all told a story of infidelity. But Tom, her sweet husband Tom, only had eyes for the sweet joy of the moment. His beautiful wife, and now mother of his child, was all that filled his senses. He didn't have a clue. Rachel cried with joy, as most new mothers do, but her tears also were mixed with guilt. Guilt over what she knew she had to do. She had to ensure that for all intents and purposes, Megan was Tom's and hers. She was determined to follow that path for as long as possible. Of course, she told Miguel, but also insisted that Megan be brought up as the daughter of herself and Tom. Miguel and she continued their meetings with one exception. He had to use protection. This wasn't going to happen again. When Megan was about to celebrate her first birthday, Rachel deepened the deception by dyeing Megan's hair to something resembling Tom's color. Many commented at her birthday party about her beautiful light brown hair, just like Tom's. Life went on with the deception continuing. Then Miguel got married. At first, Rachel was furious, but eventually rationally realized that she couldn't stop Miguel from finding a spouse. She had no claim on him, apart from the fact of Megan, who was now approaching adolescence. Miguel's wife, Amanda, was stunning. She came from a wealthy local family, well-connected to a real estate development company. Rachel was sure that her meetings with Miguel would stop now that he had a beautiful wife. Surely he wouldn't betray Amanda. Her conscious brain didn't register the hypocrisy of her being willing to betray Tom, but that the same standard would not apply to Miguel. She was intrigued and quietly pleased that Miguel made it quite clear that their secret relationship would continue. Back to the present, and that damned live TV coverage of the SWAT team deployment at their house. Rachel may have been worried about the possibility that Tom would see the report, but she hadn't expected old man Rodrigues. Giuseppe Rodrigues was an avid watcher of the news channels, and when he saw the TV report, he knew immediately what was going on. That silly, silly son of mine, he shouted at the mega screen in front of him. Why does he always think with his heart part of him understood the need for a man, especially a Rodrigues man, to be involved with as many women as possible? But he controlled his desires when he married Maria. She wasn't his first choice either. His parents and her parents had arranged their marriage without his input, but over the years he grew to respect, not so much love, this woman. This woman, Maria, who came from a privileged family and who settled into the role of a devoted wife and mother. A role that she was prepared for from birth. This woman who stoically endured 24 hours of intense labor to give birth to Miguel, then to be told by the doctor that the difficult birth ensured she would not be able to have any more children. This woman who pampered their son, Miguel. This woman who almost willed her son to quickly grow up and give her some grandchildren. This woman watched with trepidation as her son meandered from one meaningless relationship to another and then finally attempted to settle for a Danish friend, one that didn't meet the Rodrigues family requirements. This woman who quietly waited and worried for the right girl to surface while the cancer spread silently and insidiously throughout her body until she died without ever holding a grandchild. Yes, thought Giuseppe. 
Maria would roll over in her grave if she could see what her spoiled son had been up to. The Rodrigues family would not be happy. There would have to be a resolution. Honor demanded it. Sadly, Giuseppe realized that this may not end well for Miguel. The fact that he had been served in a sleazy hotel, along with that married friend, only added to the mess being piled onto the Rodrigues' name. For some reason, the court server felt the need to inform him of that fact shortly after he served the legal papers on Rachel and Miguel. That wasn't normal procedure, so someone must have paid the server extra to do it. The family needed to meet as soon as possible. Tom used his secret phone and his most disguised voice to call Rachel and inform her that another news crew was stationed outside her home and that it would be advisable to sleep somewhere else that night if she wanted any peace. Rachel took the advice and used a ride-sharing service to go to a different hotel. Things might look better after some sort of rest. She still continued to attempt to contact Tom, but everything just went to voicemail, until the number would not respond at all. Megan's phone was the same. With no Miguel, no Tom, and no Megan, Rachel felt strangely alone for perhaps the first time in her life. Meanwhile, when it became clear that Rachel would not be coming back home, my team and I went to work. First, everything of mine was loaded into the car and moving trailer. Some had to be put into the helper's cars as well. Next, all of Rachel's belongings were quickly packed into moving boxes and stacked into the garage. All of Megan's things also went with mine. All of the furniture was disassembled and placed into the garage as well. Luckily, it was a double garage. The last item of business was to change all of the locks except the garage automatic door. The internal door from the garage to the interior of the house was double bolted from the inside. Rachel now had access to her belongings and all of the furniture if she so chose, but the house, our previous house, was off limits and completely empty. Of course, I left the original garage opener in its usual hiding place just in case Rachel didn't take her key set with her. See, I wasn't a complete jerk. This was a difficult task and I certainly owed my team big time. Miguel received the summons from his father shortly after being served. Miguel knew that the serving process was not of concern to him with regard to his father's summons. But what could be so important? He knew that when his father made a summons in such a way, it left no doubt that it had to be obeyed and fast. Miguel was very nervous as he drove the distance to the family estate just out of town. If he was nervous on the drive, he nearly wet his pants and fainted when he drove onto the round entryway. There, parked in order of hierarchy, were all of the cars he knew so well since childhood. Oh my goodness, a family meeting is being held. He thought aloud as he parked his car with all of the others. He was obviously the lowest on the hierarchical list, as his was the last car to arrive. All of his uncles and surviving other close relatives would be there. It was obvious that a huge decision, one which would likely affect the whole family in some way, was about to be made. Because he didn't know the topic of the forthcoming discussion, Miguel, apart from being nervous, was very excited. He had never been allowed to attend when he was younger and since then, these meetings were a rarity he almost ran into the great hall of his family home. There they all were, arranged around a huge oak table. At the head was his dad, Giuseppe Rodrigues. Even though his relationship with his father was strained over the years, mainly due to his poor choices with relationships, he couldn't help but feel more than a little proud of his father, the head of the Rodrigues family. It was a position that Miguel hoped he could also attain one day. As he approached the table, the noise quieted down and everyone's attention shifted towards him. Miguel greeted the relatives he recognized with a smile, but it didn't feel appropriate to engage in conversation with any of them. The stares he received were either serious or neutral. A feeling of unease started to settle in Miguel's stomach as he took the only available seat at the table, which happened to be the furthest away from his father at the other end. Miguel began to realize that this gathering might be centered around him, Son, I'm glad you could make it as father stated. Like I had a choice, Miguel thought sarcastically. You probably know most of the men at this table, but let me introduce those you may not know. As each person was introduced, they nodded solemnly while Miguel nervously smiled. Giuseppe continued. We are here to discuss some incidents that have the potential to bring embarrassment and dishonor to our family within our community. Our family has always been respected by those in power, in government, 
and in successful businesses that we may have contributed to. We cannot allow this reputation to be tarnished or disappear due to the foolish actions of one of our own. Miguel, in this meeting, each person will have the opportunity to speak. After that, a, a vote will be cast to determine the punishment for the accused. The decision made will be final. All the members at the table nodded in agreement. You, my son, are the accused. You will have the chance to give your side of the story, and then you must remain silent while the rest speak. Do you understand, Giuseppe said, with venom in his voice. Yes, Papa, I understand, Miguel replied. Every eye was on him as he stood up shakily. What should I reveal, Miguel wondered. He decided to keep it brief while providing the necessary details. It all started when I was in university. Like all of you, he looked directly at each of them. I had my fair share, if not more, of relationships with girls. They were attracted to my looks and I could easily win them over. Then, I met a lovely Danish girl. She had fair skin, blonde hair, and the most beautiful blue eyes. I fell in love with her and even introduced her to you, Papa, but to ask for your blessing. But you and Mama rejected her, considering her unsuitable for our family. I was told to end the relationship and find someone more suitable. I tried, but I couldn't. I was addicted to her. It hurt both her and me when we went our separate ways. She eventually fell in love with her now husband, Tom, and I continued searching for someone suitable to marry into the family. But I couldn't find anyone, and Rachel and I still had secret meetings. Murmurs spread across the table. Though there were no loud outbursts, Miguel could hear the whispers calling her offensive names. I continued seeing Rachel, but I also met another woman who was deemed suitable by everyone. Amanda was beautiful, came from a respected family, and was willing to marry me. We got married, and now we have a wonderful daughter named Maria. Things were going well until one day, while I was with Rachel at her place. The police mistakenly raided her house, resulting in that news report. We are currently suing the authorities for their mistake. After that, Rachel and I arranged to meet at a hotel we believed was safe. However, Tom, her husband, found out about us and had Rachel served at the hotel. You know the rest Miguel lowered his head, hoping to gain sympathy. He sat back down and waited. There was an uncomfortable silence, followed by a succession of disgusted remarks from the assembled men, expressing their disgust at Miguel's infidelity and lack of concern for the consequences of his actions. His father was the last to speak. Miguel, you are my only son. What you have done shows complete disregard for two marriages, a husband, a wife, and two daughters. That might be forgivable, but the dishonor and shame you have brought upon the Rodrigues name is not. How can we hold our heads high when it is publicly known that one of our own has behaved this way? You defied a direct request from me and your late mama to end your relationship with that woman. His voice began to rise. The murmurs of agreement around the table grew louder. For this, you cannot be forgiven. Wait outside while we decide your fate, Miguel left the room feeling defeated. He closed the heavy oak doors behind him, but could still hear the angry voices on the other side. Miguel did not have high hopes. He knew that the punishments handed down by this group could be severe and swift, not only for him but possibly for Rachel too. He knew he had to escape and hope for the best. Just as his car left the estate, the clan reached a decision. They called out for him, but he didn't answer. He was to be banished to another country until the clan felt mercy and allowed him to return. His escape only fueled the anger and disbelief of the group. They now openly demanded his blood. Giuseppe couldn't silence this new call for his son's death. The weight of the world rested on his shoulders. Not only would he lose his only son, but he would also lose the opportunity to pass down leadership of the clan to his own family. It would now go to another relative. Giuseppe would soon find himself in a different seat at the table while someone else led the clan. He would be alone, without a wife, son, or prestige. The group had its own established process for delivering such a sentence. It was beyond Giuseppe's control. Miguel's fate was sealed. That night, Tom received a mysterious phone call. It was from an anonymous number, and the caller spoke with a thick accent. Mr. Wildthorpe? Mr. Tom Wildthorpe? We are aware of what has recently happened in your marriage. We have decided to provide justice for the terrible misfortunes you and your daughter have faced. 
Our advice is for you to immediately leave the country for at least two weeks. Make sure you are seen in public at all times. This is crucial. Do you understand? A sum of money has been placed in your apartment's mailbox, which should cover your trip and expenses. There is also a flight ticket in your name. The flight departs at 6 in the morning. Please take this advice seriously. The call ended abruptly. Tom knew by the caller's tone that this was serious. He found the package in his mailbox as described. It appeared he was flying to Brisbane, Australia, and had reservations for two weeks at a luxurious resort on the Gold Coast. He finished packing and boarded the Qantas flight the following morning. Tom informed Megan about his trip, attributing it to the need for some time away after the emotional strain he had been through. Tom couldn't help but wonder what had led to this warning. He had a restless journey over the long flight. At times, he glanced around to break the monotony and noticed a woman with a young girl a few seats away. A fleeting look brought back memories and connected the dots. It was the daughter that caught his attention. She bore a striking resemblance to Megan, a younger version of her. He knew exactly who they were. It was Amanda Rodriguez and her daughter. He remembered her from the stakeout of Miguel's house, a time that felt so long ago. Since Amanda didn't know him, he debated whether to introduce himself. In the end, he decided to wait until they disembarked at Brisbane Airport. That's precisely what he did. The baggage claim area was crowded enough that if there were to be a confrontation, he could easily blend in with the other waiting passengers. Mrs. Rodriguez, you don't know me, but I know you were the first words he uttered. Amanda was dumbfounded, searching for security or an escape route. Eventually, realizing that all her options were limited due to her young daughter and lack of luggage, she reluctantly faced this man and demanded, Who are you and how do you know my name? My name is Tom Wildthorpe, Amanda. Your husband, Miguel, and my soon-to-be ex-wife, Rachel, have been having a long-term affair. Starting before either of us got married, Tom's decision to be honest with Amanda had a shocking effect on her. She nearly fainted, but Tom managed to support her before she collapsed on the terminal floor. Perhaps we should sit down over there, Tom suggested, pointing to a nearby cafe. We can collect our luggage in a moment after settling Amanda and her daughter, Maria, who clung to her mother, they shared their experiences over the past 24 hours. It seemed that Amanda had also received a similar phone call to Tom's and like him, she had taken it seriously. Once they retrieved their luggage, they embarked on the long drive from Brisbane to the Gold Coast. Unbeknownst to them, they were both staying at the same resort. It would be a sleepless night for everyone involved. Rachel finally returned home to face the consequences with Tom. She was anxious about explaining everything to her longtime partner. As she approached the house, she realized that her keys no longer worked, but the garage opener still did. When the door lifted, Rachel was devastated by the sight before her. All the furniture was neatly packed and stacked into boxes with her name on them. There was a note pinned to the closest box by the garage door. Nervously, Rachel picked up the note. Rachel, by now you would have been served, you dishonest person. Don't try to contact me because I'll be overseas when you read this. If you need to talk to me, contact my lawyer, Marion Smithson. Her number is 545-78790. I've booked and paid for a small apartment for the next six months. The keys are on top of the first box. It's up to you to figure out how to move your belongings there. Whether you want to stay in that apartment after six months is your decision. Hopefully, if you've signed the divorce papers, we will almost be divorced by then, and our fake marriage will be a thing of the past. Megan already knows about you and that person, Miguel. I told her about your recent actions. She didn't know that you continued your relationship with him after he became Megan's parent. You'll need to repair your relationship with her, but I want no part in it. You made your bed, now deal with it. I hope to never see or talk to you again. Tom, if only Tom knew how accurate his last words were. Although the note was filled with anger, Tom would have been horrified if he knew what would happen to Rachel in the future. Rachel collapsed on the cold garage floor surrounded by the remnants of her broken marriage and life with Tom. All she had left were boxes of meaningless possessions and feelings of loss and despair. She slowly realized the extent of the mess she had created. There was no going back. The move to her new apartment went smoothly since everything was already packed and ready to go. Unpacking and arranging her things only intensified her feelings of despair and hopelessness. Her new home felt empty and cold. 
Rachel wondered what she should do. The apartment was paid for the next six months, but she had no job. Finding employment became her top priority, but she was unsure of where to start. The feelings of hopelessness, loneliness, and despair threatened to consume her. However, deep inside, she found her determination. She refused to give up. This strength propelled her through the dark days that followed. She completed application after application, but no one was willing to hire someone her age without experience in building design. Rachel regretted not exploring job opportunities earlier in life. Just when she was about to lose hope, she received a phone call from MS. San Diego, representing a building company called Mexico Designs and Construction. Mrs. Whitethorpe, we noticed you're looking for employment in the building design industry, yes. That's correct, replied Rachel. We might have a position for you. It's a six-month contract that involves travel abroad. Are you interested, Mrs. Whitethorpe definitely, Rachel exclaimed, trying to contain her excitement. However, there might be a small issue. Though I don't have any family obligations, my apartment lease will expire during that time. That's not a problem, Mrs. Whitethorpe. May I call you Rachel? Yes, of course. You see, one of the benefits of this job is that we will take care of your apartment during your travels. When you return, you can simply continue your lease payments. We'll even inform your landlord about your absence in case any unexpected issues arise. We'll cover your utilities, insurance, and other expenses. How does that sound, Rachel? That sounds amazing. When would you like me to start? As soon as possible, really. We have an interview process to go through, and we need to verify your qualifications. How about tomorrow for the interview? If everything goes well, you could start next Monday and fly out on Sunday. Does that work for you? I'll see you at our office tomorrow morning at 9 MS. San Diego or Juanita informed Rachel, providing her with the address and dress code for the interview. Rachel couldn't believe her luck. Although she found some of the interview requests strange, her enthusiasm clouded her judgment. She had been out of touch with the job scene for so long that she didn't realize what was normal anymore. She spent a long time deciding what to wear for the interview. Her bedroom was a mess of discarded outfits. Eventually, she settled on a fitted suit ensemble that highlighted her best features without revealing too much. Underneath her jacket, she wore a modest white shirt. Completing her look with professional medium high heels, Rachel appeared as a confident businesswoman. She also put effort into her hair and makeup, enhancing her professional image. Rachel nervously waited in the small office area. The secretary typed away, the sounds only adding to her anxiety. Finally, a young woman emerged from an office and introduced herself as MS. Constantine Santiago. Come on in, Rachel. Wow, you look amazing. I will be conducting the interview, along with Marcel Venjuala and Diego Consorta, the directors of the company Constantine said, leading Rachel to the middle of the office. The two men were seated behind a large desk. Something about them seemed off, but Rachel dismissed it as nerves. Let me take your jacket before you sit down, Rachel Constantine kindly requested. Rachel complied, conscious that she was now only wearing a shirt. The air conditioning was making her sensitive, which added to her discomfort. Rachel, you're interested in working for us on a six-month contract, correct? I can assure you the pay will be higher than what you'd earn here, despite your lack of experience. However, your skills as a mother could be advantageous, Constantine explained. Rachel looked at Constantine, suspicious of the comment. However, Constantine quickly redirected the conversation, leaving her with more demanding questions. Towards the end of the interview, the two men exchanged sideways glances and lewd smirks, focusing on Rachel's body. Constantine kept Rachel engaged with challenging questions. Once the interview concluded, the two men nodded at Constantine and abruptly left the office. Well, said Constantine, that went well. Both directors were impressed with what they saw and heard. I can confidently say you've got the position. You'll fly to Mexico City this Sunday, where a limousine will pick you up at the airport and take you to the building site office. It's quite a drive, but the limousine is stocked with refreshments. Lucky you. A company representative will take care of your apartment details tomorrow. Welcome aboard, M Rachel. We hope you'll enjoy the opportunities that come your way. Thank you for coming today. I won't see you again since my role is limited to the employment process. Goodbye and good luck. With that, Constantine led Rachel to the door. 
Rachel felt a whirlwind of emotions. Everything had happened so fast, her suspicions about the two directors were overshadowed by her excitement. She had secured her future, independent of Tom and Miguel. Rachel floated on cloud nine as she returned to her apartment. Unbeknownst to Rachel, as soon as she left the office, Constantine and the secretary swiftly dismantled the room to erase any evidence of a legitimate office. When Rachel returned to her flat, the rooms where the interview took place were completely empty, devoid of any DNA samples. The flights went smoothly, and just as promised, a limousine awaited Rachel at Mexico City Airport. The driver roughly tossed her suitcases into the back as Rachel observed. However, he did show her where she could find refreshments inside the vehicle. The drive through the crowded city soon became very boring, so Rachel took advantage of the many drinks available. Little did she know, each drink was laced with a powerful sedative that soon put her soundly to sleep. Unbeknownst to her, the driver made a phone call. Four hours later, the limo came to a stop in a medium-sized town. They parked behind an unassuming building that looked like a motel with a restaurant out front. Rachel was still completely unconscious, unaware of what was happening to her. Two men carried her into one of the rooms. Both Megan and Tom never heard from Rachel again. They were informed by her landlord about her recent job situation and assumed she had chosen to disappear. Their divorce was finalized without any objections. Meanwhile, Miguel's escape from his relatives did not go as planned. He ended up in a hotel in a small town in the Midwest. Late at night, he received a sudden and silent call to his room. A well-orchestrated attack rendered him unconscious, and his room was meticulously cleaned to erase any evidence of his presence. The cash he had paid for the room left no trace of his short stay. When Miguel finally woke up, he instantly regretted it. He found himself suspended by his neck over a tub of scalding hot water. But that wasn't the worst part. He noticed that he was bleeding into the tub, and the pain radiating from his lower area was excruciating. Looking around, he saw to his horror a stainless steel tray containing severed reproductive parts. Overwhelmed with anguish and disbelief, he realized that those body parts were his own. He thrashed about, causing the blood flow and pain to intensify, but he was helpless. I see you finally awakened, fool. Please forgive me, but I decided to alter your appearance slightly. Don't worry, though. I only removed the parts that got you into trouble. The parts that clouded your judgment and caused dishonor and shame to our family. Now, have a look at the screen in front of you. You may recognize the main actress Miguel glared at the screen, which displayed what appeared to be a film. On closer inspection, he saw Rachel, or someone who looked like her. The drugged woman seemed lifeless as three unwashed men violated her. Miguel understood that this had been going on for some time. Just look at the great job she's doing the voice taunted Miguel. She's in high demand. She may not only be a receptacle for their desires, but she's also happy. The painkillers I gave you will wear off soon, so you'll fully experience the loss. I'm not heartless, though. I'll let you be entertained during your final hours. Enjoy Rachel's adventures to the fullest. The man left, turning up the volume on the sound of Rachel's film to its maximum level. Giuseppe received a phone call shortly before dinner. He listened solemnly and muttered, thank you another tragic chapter unfolded in his life. But he thought somberly, it won't happen again Tom spent a lot of time with Amanda at the Gold Coast. The atmosphere there seemed perfect for romance. Although recent events had dimmed their mutual attraction, Tom and Amanda formed a strong bond during those two weeks. They were inseparable. There was no intimacy at that time, but it would come later, and even later, there would be wedding bells. Amidst all the tragedy, two wounded souls found some peace, normalcy, and, more importantly, love. The police knew they had no chance of pinning the disappearance of their ex-spouses on Tom or Amanda. Their alibis were airtight. Just two more unsolved cases to add to the ever-growing stack. And who really cared anyway? Tom knew he had one last act to perform in this tragedy. It was something he wasn't looking forward to. Amanda, his now wife, encouraged him to do it as a final act of closure. The mansion door swung open, revealing a well-dressed servant. Please follow me, mister, Wildthorpe the servant said. Tom was led into a large hall with a massive oak table in the center. Seated at one end was an older man who bore a resemblance to the man who caused all the suffering. What can I do for you, mister? Wildthorpe the man asked. 
Mr. Rodrigues, I wish we were meeting under different circumstances, but such is life, Tom replied. Yes, Tom. May I call you Tom? You can call me Giuseppe. Given the unfortunate way we are connected through this tragedy, I believe formality is unnecessary. Now what brings you here? Giuseppe, I know you're aware that your son's ex-wife, Amanda, and I are now married. She is no longer a Rodrigues, but a Wildthorpe. I realize this must be devastating for you. He was your only son, and now he seems to have disappeared, along with Rachel. I assure you, what I made every effort to find them, but with no success. I can only assume they disappeared out of shame for their actions. I have moved past my anger and betrayal. My love for Amanda, her daughter Maria, and my daughter Megan have eradicated any hate I once had. I am truly grateful for that. A profound sadness washed over Giuseppe. He slumped in his seat. Yes, Tom. They have received what they deserved, he said, glancing at me. He expected me to ask for an explanation, but my instincts told me to leave it alone. It seemed best for me not to know. Giuseppe, I understand the feeling of loss you must be experiencing. I've come to offer you some solace in this time of sadness. Megan, my daughter, is actually the child of your son and my ex-wife. She is as much your grandchild as she is my daughter. Maria, Amanda's daughter, is also your grandchild. You have two beautiful grandchildren. I am extending an invitation for you to stay involved in their lives. They need to remain connected to their familial roots. You are the only remaining link to their Rodrigues heritage. They need you. Tears streamed down Giuseppe's face. It took him a moment to compose himself. You have no idea what this means to me, Tom. I would be honored to be a more active grandfather to my grandchildren. This house is cold and empty, lacking the joy, laughter, and familial warmth that children bring. From the bottom of my heart, thank you, Tom. He stood up and approached me. I wasn't expecting a full hug, but it didn't feel strange either. There was an understanding and depth of emotion shared between us that only two people who have endured hell and survived can understand. He whispered hoarsely in my ear, You are welcome at this family table, Tom. As he released the hug, he regained his composure and said, We are having a family gathering this Sunday. It would be my great honor for you, Amanda, and the girls to attend, so I can properly introduce them to their relatives. I have a feeling my clan members would be overjoyed to welcome the new additions.